Today is the day we've finally been waiting for. I have finally gotten my hands on the all new Ford Mustang Mach-E. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I've actually ordered a Mustang Mach-E and it happens to be exactly the model that I'm driving down here in Los Angeles today. But this is not the Mustang Mach-E that I ordered. This one belongs to Ford. So full disclosure, I do have one of these on order. In this video, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about the Mustang Mach-E, except for how it drives. That is still under embargo, so be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so, because that video is coming up very, very soon. Let's start out by taking a look at the front. Ford wanted to make this look definitely like a member of the Mustang family, so they gave this sort of a faux grille here. It kind of reminds me of a handlebar mustache motif there with this black line running around that faux grille area. There is actually a grille down lower at the bottom of the bumper. This has active grille shutters. They'll open when you turn on the air conditioning, when additional cooling for the battery system is required, but most of the time they're going to be closed. They'll also open if you're DC fast charging, again to cool off that battery pack. We have multi-module LED headlights up front and sequential turn signals that you'll see flashing over there on that side. No fog lights are located down at the bottom of the bumper. The front end was definitely very aggressively designed for aero. Be sure and let me know what you think about the design of the Mach-E down there in the comment section below. I like the front end design a bit more than we see in the Tesla Model Y. I think the headlamps are a bit more distinctive and more expressive, and I like the sort of faux grille shape going on up front. That's one thing I really loved with the Tesla Model S when it first launched, but the newer designs of Tesla's where it sort of looks like someone has a pair of pantyhose over their face, something along those lines, I haven't cared for that look quite as much. That's definitely what we see in the Tesla Model Y. Now, the Model Y is, I think, more restrained and more elegant in terms of design, but if you're looking for something that's a bit more aggressive and distinctive, there's the Mustang Mach-E. Ford definitely tried to keep some styling cues from the Mustang. They gave this a longer dash to axle ratio than you find in some EVs, certainly than something like the Jaguar I-Pace. That gives this a longer hood proportion, a little bit more like the rest of the Mustang lineup. Of course, the big difference between this and the other Mustangs is that we have four doors, and this is a crossover, so it really has more of a hatch than a liftback or a sportback style. Moving around to the side, this is 185.6 inches long. This is only one inch shorter than the Tesla Model Y, so definitely right in the same neighborhood, and pretty similar to a lot of compact crossovers. But unlike most compact crossovers, you'll notice that the true shape of this vehicle resembles, honestly, the shape of a lifted Toyota Prius, very much like we find in the Tesla Model Y. That's all due to aerodynamics. They simply couldn't make this baby Bronco shaped and have the same kind of efficiency that we find in this or of course that Tesla Model Y. They've tried to disguise the shape a little bit as sort of a sportback model. You can see that the red body curves right there around to the hatchback and then we have this black section that bumps out towards the rear. Trying to disguise the eye a little bit that this is a crossover and give it perhaps more of an Audi A7 look in the back. Primarily for aerodynamic reasons, we don't find traditional door handles on the Mach-E, but we also don't find fold-out or flip-out handles like we find in some of the competition. Instead, we have a fixed itty-bitty little handle right here on the back side of the driver and front passenger door, and then electric releases on all four doors. I simply press the button when the car is unlocked. You can either have the key fob or, of course, your phone, because this does support phone-as-key technology. The door will then pop out from the car. You can press pretty hard on the door. It has anti-pinch protection, so that if you accidentally get your hand in there, it won't get squished. On the rear doors, we have something different. We have the same sort of button, but we have no itty bitty little handle. This front handle kind of reminds me of a little pinky that you grab onto. Instead, you're supposed to grab onto the inside of this rear door and then go ahead and open it. Ford says this was designed for children because a lot of children like to grab on the door rather than simply pulling on a handle. Most logically, this was primarily due to aerodynamics because the button is a little bit higher than the front door. And if you're a kid that couldn't reach a traditional door handle, you're probably gonna have a bit of a problem reaching that power button. In case you're wondering, the rear doors have the same pinch protection as the front, so I press the button, door pops out. You can then press pretty hard on the door, it doesn't go back in. If you press extremely hard, actually rocking the car, then the door will relatch. Is this an electric crossover or is it a pregnant all-wheel drive electric hatchback? I don't really have the answer for you. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Ground clearance in this is 5.8 inches. That is a little bit lower than the Tesla Model Y at 6.6 .6 inches, but both of these vehicles are honestly pretty similar to the average American minivan when it comes to ground clearance. If you want real ground clearance in a vehicle this size with an electric drivetrain, you basically have one option, and that would be the Jaguar I-Pace. It's gonna be significantly more expensive than any version of the Mach-E, but it will give you an adaptive air suspension with a ton of ground clearance and a rated water fording ability. Moving around to the side, you can see more of that attempted sport back styling. The hatch itself definitely is a little bit more horizontal than it is vertical, however. 
From this angle, you can see that we have a really strong shoulder design, and the rear end definitely is styled like the rest of the Mustang lineup. We have this distinctive three-lamp tail lamp design. A lot of folks have asked me, how is it that Ford can get away with what looks like a sequential turn signal back here? It is amber, which is definitely my preference. The big reason for that is that you'll notice that the three sections on the outside of the tail lamp module are simply flashing on off. The progressive section is the one over here inboard of that module. According to the government, as far as they're concerned, the three modules on the outside are the turn signal. The other one is simply an accent light. That's how Ford can get away with it. Lighting laws in America are honestly pretty outdated and pretty stupid, and that's why we can't find all the fancy headlights and tail lights that we see in Europe. But we do have full LED tail lamp modules. To keep the design nice and clean, Ford engineers located the backup light down there at the bottom of the bumper in the black section. We have well-integrated parking sensors and then an electric Ford Mustang logo. Due to the design of modern EVs, there's no way to see the battery or the electric motors. You'll just have to trust me that they exist. There are going to be two different battery packs available in the Mach-E to start with, a 75.7 kilowatt hour pack and a 98.8 kilowatt hour pack. At the moment, 66 kilowatt hours are going to be usable if you choose the base pack and 88 kilowatt hours usable if you choose the larger pack. That is more capacity than we find currently in the Tesla Model Y, but it appears that efficiency in the Mach-E is a little bit lower than we see in the Tesla. Of course, it could also be that Ford has elected to derate the range of the Mach-E. They may not be following exactly the same schedules for testing that we find with Tesla, but we'll know a little bit more about that when this goes on sale a little bit later in the year. Power output will vary based on whether you get the standard range or extended range pack and whether you choose rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. The standard range pack is available with two different configurations, rear wheel drive, 266 horsepower and 317 pound-feet of torque, or all wheel drive that bumps the torque figure up to 428 but does not change the horsepower output. Most of the Mach-E's are likely going to have the extended range battery pack. That's going to give you 290 horsepower and 317 pound-feet of torque if you choose rear wheel drive, 346 and 428 if you choose all wheel drive, and then if you get the GT trim that bumps horsepower up to 480, torque to 600, or 634 if you get the optional performance trim of that GT model. The GT model is going to happen a little bit later, so if you want to get your hands on a Ford Mustang Mach-E at the beginning, it's going to be the standard range model or the extended range model, rear wheel drive or all wheel drive your choice. Range is a hot button issue with any EV out there. If you choose the standard range battery pack, which has no corollary in the Tesla Model Y lineup at the moment, Tesla elected not to give us a standard range version of that model, you'll get 230 miles or 211 if you choose all wheel drive. The extended range pack, which is what this model has on it right here, will range between 235 if you get the top end performance version of the Mustang GT to 300 miles if you choose the extended range rear wheel drive. And then the all wheel drive model in premium trim, which is what this model is right next to me, will give you 270 miles. That's about 46 miles below what we find in the Tesla Model Y. But again, it's important to keep in mind that not every EV manufacturer out there calculates range the same way. Tesla tends to go for the most aggressive methods of calculation for range, and we don't know exactly which calculation method Ford used just yet, so you will have to wait until I can get my hands on one of these at home to really tell you what its real-world range will be. Tesla is unquestionably the leader when it comes to EV system efficiency, so even though we have a bigger battery pack in this model than we find in the Tesla Model Y, and even though the Tesla Model Y's range estimates are a little optimistic, I would not be surprised if it still posted longer ranges than we find in the Mustang Mach-E. But again, you'll have to wait until I can get my hands on one of these at home. You might logically be cross-shopping the Mach-E against something like a Kia Niro EV or a Hyundai Kona EV if you're simply looking for an EV with a hatch and you're looking at the base Mach-E that is two-wheel drive. But those vehicles were not designed from the ground up to be electric vehicles, and as a result, there are a few compromises. And that's not what we see in the Mustang Mach-E. We have a very large cargo area in the back, which we'll take a look at in a bit, and a frunk in the front. But first, let's talk about the seats. I find the driver's seat very comfortable, but just a little bit less comfortable than the one that we find in the Tesla Model Y. We don't have a four-way adjustable lumbar support. It's just two-way in the Mustang Mach-E, and the seat bottom cushion does not adjust for tilt. It simply adjusts for height, although it is powered and memory linked with a three-position memory over there on the door. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion. And unlike many mainstream crossovers, the front passenger seat has exactly the same range of motion as the driver's seat. Driver's headroom changes based on whether you get the optional panoramic moonroof or not. You won't find that in the absolute base model, but most Mach-E's will have that feature. It's a sheet of glass very similar to what we find in modern Teslas. That really improves front headroom in the Mach-E. It doesn't really have much of an impact on rear headroom though, so if you're looking for the most headroom, definitely keep that in mind. 
At this point, no doubt, there are going to be a ton of comments in the comment section. Why is he talking so much about the Tesla Model Y when we're taking a look at a Mustang Mach-E? Well, obviously, the Tesla Model Y is the benchmark in this segment. It is not the first. That would actually be the Jaguar I-Pace, but it is certainly the volume seller when it comes to current EVs in North America and electric crossovers. So it's simply the benchmark by which everything else must be judged at the moment. In terms of legroom, this comes in at 81.4 inches of combined legroom. So that's a little bit less than the Ford Escape and pretty similar to the Tesla Model Y, although just a hair less. Rear seat headroom is very similar to the Tesla Model Y. I can very comfortably sit back here. My hair is brushing the ceiling, but it's not touching the ceiling. The glass roof that you can probably barely see on your screen does not affect rear seat headroom because of the way the ceiling is shaped right back here by the headrests, but it does have a positive effect on front seat headroom because there's a lot of space right there between the glass roof and the headrest. Glass roofs are a trick that a number of electric vehicles out there use to make the interior feel more spacious, but still give you a lower slung roof line, which is required for efficient driving. Rear seat passengers get two large air vents here, some USB charge only ports, and because this platform was designed from the ground up to be an EV, we have a completely flat floor, just like we find in the Tesla Model Y. One thing I noticed back here is that the front seat tracks don't impede on rear seat legroom and footroom area quite as much as we see in the Tesla Model Y. That's because in the Model Y, they simply lifted things up from the Model 3. They used the same seat frames in the Model 3, same center console, etc. And then we have these weird islands where they bolt down into the floor. We don't see that in the Mach-E. Leaning back in the center seat, I have a ton of headroom available, although the headrest does not pop terribly high up. This is best reserved for children, obviously, but you could definitely fit three adults back here if you wanted to. There's a ton of legroom and a ton of headroom as well. Eventually, there will be several ways to get into the front trunk, although at the moment, there's just a mechanical release on the driver's side. You pull it twice and it will open the front trunk. But there is an electric release mechanism that will be activated via an over-the-air update later that will let you do that from the phone app or from the cabin via the infotainment system as well. The Mach-E will be sold around the world, and in order to comply with everybody's regulations, we have a cargo divider system right here in the front trunk. It is removable. You could just pull out these little stoppers right there and then remove the divider from the trunk. We have an electric release right there for the front trunk as well. Ford has designed this to be used as an ice cooler, so right back there at the bottom we have an active drain. It doesn't have a plug by default, but the ice will drain out when you use it as a cooler. We also have some cup holders right there. And then if we move on up to the hood, you'll notice that the hood has actually been dished out a little bit to improve the cargo carrying capacity of that trunk. So items don't have to simply be level with the opening of the front trunk, they can actually bulge out a little bit. It's now time for the AOA exclusive trunk comfort index. Of course, I have my trunk comfort index shirt on. You can find one of these yourself over at AOAmerch.com. I like the fact that we have a two-stage load floor. So you can lower this down, get a little bit of extra cargo area or raise it up so it's approximately level with the cargo opening. We have a flexible cargo cover right here, which is perhaps a little bit more practical than some of those hard cargo covers. However, this is a little bit more difficult to remove than the roller style variety, this can be folded up right like that and stored very easily inside the Mach-E. On the downside, the Mach-E loses points for not having anywhere where we could put a spare tire in here, and this cargo area is just a little bit compact, so I'm going to go ahead and give this 8 out of 10 points in my exclusive trunk comfort index. If you're looking for an EV that feels futuristic but also familiar at the same time, the Mustang Mach-E definitely qualifies because even though this has a lot of design cues that we see in other modern EVs like this enormous glass moonroof right here that goes to just over the rear passenger's heads but does not have a shade on it, a lot of the rest of the interior feels very Ford traditional. As I've mentioned in Tesla reviews, I really wish this window was electrochromatic or it had some sort of shade or something like that on it. Obviously, they're going to be aftermarket solutions, but I do find the enormous panes of glass just a little bit distracting in really strong sunlight. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts and four-way adjustable ratchet style headrests. The upholstery in this model is perforated on the seat back and seat bottom cushions, although these seats are not ventilated, they are just heated. The interior quality in the Mach-E is light years ahead of any other Mustang in America right now. And honestly, I think this interior really competes with a lot of Lincoln products when it comes to the fit and finish and just the parts quality as well. Ford has done an excellent job of integrating fabric inserts into this interior. So we find them on the speaker rolls. You'll see them on the dashboard in a bit as well. There's a lot of soft touch material going on on the front doors. We have a soft touch upper section and then a soft touch stitched armrest there as well. The buttons are all pretty familiar. If you've seen a Ford product before, we have the same door unlock and lock buttons and same window switches as we have in the past. 
A decent amount of time before the Mach-E became public, I was able to see, sit in, and ride in a Mach-E. And one thing that really impressed me back then and continues to is the build quality that we find inside the Mach-E's cabin. The rear doors are upholstered in a very similar fashion to the front doors. We find hard plastics only down there at the bottom of the door. And Ford has really done an excellent job at mixing materials, like the fabric covers to the speaker grills, etc. Everything in here has a much more premium feel than you'd find really in any other modern Ford vehicle. But this is a direction that Ford seems to be going in because the new Bronco Sport and the Bronco also have definitely upscale interiors. Moving back up to the front, we find more of that fabric trim on the dashboard in a stretch that goes all the way from one side of the dash to the other. It's interrupted only by the infotainment screen in the middle. I have to say, I really like this particular look. This car has the optional B&O audio system, so we find little B&O logos here and there. We have pretty typical air vents below, so if you don't like digital air vents, you might want to get something like this. An open and close knob on that side, and then we find a very similar air vent over here on the left side of the passenger area. Some sort of imitation carbon fiber stamping in this area. Soft touch materials lower after stitched right there as well. And then we find a pretty traditionally sized bin style glove compartment. I was not able to fit a larger tablet computer inside, but some of those smaller 7 or 8 inch systems might fit. Ford has made a big deal out of their new infotainment software, and I think rightly so. This really is a big design shift from any other Ford product that we've seen before, although the software in the new F-150 appears to be somewhat similar. This large tablet-sized display reminds me of the one that's in my Samsung refrigerator. It is definitely enormous for the dashboard, and it's floating above everything, so there's really no bottom connection right there to the center console, no top connection either. It's a very, very large, attractive display. And then we have a physical knob integrated into the screen before. It's actually just glued onto the surface, and then it uses some tactile functions to connect with the display. So the display continues through the middle. It's a little bit easier if we take a look at this system, perhaps, in sections. We have smartphone integration, and the smartphone integration uses a decent portion of the screen. Now the latest versions of Apple CarPlay do support a portrait orientation, so theoretically this could have used more of the screen if Ford had wanted it to, but the screen is so large that the image really is among the largest you'll find in any CarPlay implementation out there. It appears to be probably about 9 to 10 inches across diagonally in that way. At the top we have a button where you can access things like drive modes more directly, engage, whisper, or of course unbridled since we're in a Mustang. You can also access the 360 degree camera image. And in this mode, Ford uses the screen real estate a little bit better than some of the other portrait orientation screens that we've seen out there, where we have the 360 degree image up top and then a large display back there for the backup camera or forward camera, depending on what mode you're in. There are a number of different views available. You can see the parking sensors there. You can see different camera views, a 360 degree camera view up top. You can also zoom in on there if you want. So if I want to zoom in on that particular quadrant, I can do that. If I want to zoom in over there on that rear quarter, I can do that as well. You can also disable the parking sensors right from this screen. Taking a page out of other EVs, Ford has really gone minimalistic when it comes to buttons in the interior, but I think Ford has found a good balance of buttons versus touch implementations. So we still have a bunch of buttons on the steering wheel. We have turn signal stocks, windshield wiper stocks, things like that, a power button for the car rather than simply walking up and turning on the car. So I think they've found a pretty decent balance for that. Well, we're on the drive mode screen. I should mention that we do have a one pedal drive mode in the Mach-E and it is disabled. So if you don't want that, you can just turn that off. I'm not a huge fan of the one pedal drive. I just prefer the brake pedal because this does have blended braking. It's not a simple on-off regen system, lift-off regen like we find in Teslas. This does have a blended brake system. As with other Ford vehicles, there's a self-parking system. This can also be directly accessed via a physical button to make that really easy to use. You can adjust the driver assistance settings in here as well. Moving over to the settings option, this is where we find more traditional vehicle and audio system settings like tone, balance, fade, phone stuff. The charge settings are controlled in here. So for instance, we can choose uh, charge scheduling or departure and comfort times. The car can automatically turn itself off, rear occupant alert, easy entry, my key, all that kind of stuff, windows, wipers, power lift gate. You can also adjust the door keypad code, very much like other Ford products. This has a keypad on the outside, so you can set a particular code and then open the vehicle just with that. That's a really handy touch that we find basically just in Ford vehicles at the moment. You can opt to turn on and off the braking coach displays and set up a backup start code if you want to. Over here under general, we have our pretty typical readouts, English, temperature units, that sort of thing. And then under display, we can adjust how this display looks and feels. So for instance, if we would like the center display to automatically give us the light or dark mode, you can adjust that right there, or you can do it manually. I should mention that I have really dry hands, so some of the times where this system doesn't seem to have recognized me, it's probably my finger's fault. We have a connectivity option here where we can adjust connected vehicle features, manage Wi-Fi networks, all that sort of stuff, and then system updates, mobile apps, departure comfort, all that kind of stuff going on here, and then even ambient light controlling for the interior. 
you can select the color and you can select the brightness right in here. Versus the Tesla Model Y infotainment screen, this software seems to be a little bit less responsive at times, but it is more fully featured. So there's a lot more going on in this system than we find in the Tesla system, but some of the options in here may not respond quite as quickly as you'd like. We do have swipe gestures, however, which is how we'd get back to the home screen that you see here. At the bottom of the screen, we find controls for the heated seats. We can put them in an auto mode if you like there, heated steering wheel, fan controls, defogger, defroster, that sort of thing. And then the rest of the climate controls just above that. You can adjust the fan auto mode in three different levels. We then have a bunch of cards above that. So we have navigation, our infotainment there, tire pressure monitoring, this trip readouts as well. And the larger info screen will then pop up. I can also hit that expand button if I wanna use even more of the screen. For instance, if I clicked over here to CarPlay, I can choose this option. You'll notice it's not using the entire screen right there, although it is blanked out. I can hit that shrink button. That's just for consistency primarily. One nice touch when using CarPlay is I have direct access right there over to our settings that makes it a little bit easier to change things like your sound settings when you're in CarPlay. Some cars sort of hide that out. Uh, let's go back to the home screen there. If we click over to the Sirius XM mode. You can see we have a pretty typical satellite radio display. Again, I can shrink that in if I want a little bit more of those card information showing at the bottom. I can click over to the navigation option and then expand this, and then the map will take up a larger portion of the screen. You can opt for 2D or 3D views. You can rotate the image around, but it's not gonna give us satellite imagery like we find in some of the competition's displays. As you'd expect in a modern EV, it will, however, add EV stations to your route automatically. So if it detects that you need to charge, it will tell you how to charge, where to charge, and how long you need to charge along your route. Something that we've seen in a number of other vehicles out there. You have 3D building uh, information right there on that navigation screen as well. As of course, we also have traffic information on the display. Going down the dashboard, we find the USB inputs for that infotainment system. This does support wireless smartphone integration, so you can see that one of those smartphones is connected wirelessly. We have one Qi wireless charging mat, and then just another location where you can store a smartphone, but you can see some of those larger smartphones won't quite fit there side by side. Two pretty decently sized cup holders right there, and then we have another stitch section that's a little bit higher from that. We have a rotary dial shifter, something that we've found in other Ford vehicles before. The automated parking button, I like the fact that there is a physical button for that. It makes that really easy to interact with, and then an electric parking brake button right there. If you'd rather use a key rather than your phone as a key, we have a pretty traditionally styled Ford key right there with just a lock and unlock button. Between the front seats, we find a padded stitched armrest that opens to reveal a storage cubby right there underneath with a roller cover so you can very easily open that and close it. It's pretty deep because again, the floor is flat in this vehicle. We have a 12 volt charge port there and you could very easily keep things like smartphones that didn't need to be charged or were charging via cable right there in that area and they'll very easily fit under the armrest. Also, thanks to the flat load floor, we find an additional storage area right there under the Qi wireless charging mat. Maybe I'm just stuck in the 20th century, but I do like an instrument cluster right behind the steering wheel that gives us things like our speedometer and critical driver information. This is a fairly small widescreen display. It's very eccentrically widescreen, one might say. It's about two and a half inches tall and what looks to be perhaps about 10 inches long. The two basic modes for this display are light and dark. You can also automatically have those change nighttime versus daytime if you want to. But this display is not as configurable as some LCD instrument clusters. However, we do get turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions. Below this, you'll notice these blinking lights here. These are not visible to the naked eye. These are actually part of the driver monitoring system. This will enable the hands-off-the-wheel driving system that we'll see coming a little bit later in 2021. That's going to be available via a $600 software update. The reason the camera can see them is that these operate on a different wavelength of light than the human eye can perceive, but the camera is able to pick them up. So how much will a Mach-E set you back? Well, they're gonna start at $42,895, but they still qualify for the full federal tax credit. And that's the big difference if you're trying to compare this to something like a Tesla Model Y. The Model Y no longer has that full tax credit. So if you wanna take a page out of Tesla's playbook and use their math, the base model is gonna be $35,395. But keep in mind, you have to qualify for that full tax credit in order for it to apply to your situation. So be sure and consult a tax professional as to whether that applies to you. If you want the premium trim, which is what this model is right here, that'll start at $47,000 with the standard range pack. The dual motor option adds $2,700, getting the extended range battery pack adds $5,000, and extended range battery pack with the dual motor, $7,700. That means that if you're taking a look at a model like this red one right next to me, it's gonna be effectively about $47,500 
after the federal tax credit. If you want the GT model, that's going to be the fastest version. It's going to get you 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, according to Ford. That's going to be basically targeted very directly at the Model Y dual motor performance. That one's going to be $60,500 starting. That model is going to be available only with the extended range battery pack and the dual motor setup. And if you want to go the fastest possible in your model, you'll have to get the performance package option, which bumps torque out of the dual motor setup. There are obviously some differences in feature content between this and the Model Y and the Volkswagen ID4, but I think Ford has priced this very competitively. If you're concerned about additional dealer market because this is a relatively hot new vehicle, then it may put your mind at ease to know that Ford is going to be building about 60,000 of these in the first year. So supply is not going to be as limited as some vehicles out there. For instance, they're going to be building more of these in their first year of production than apparently Toyota will of the RAV4 Prime. And if you head over to the Mustang Mach-E forums, there are a number of them out there. They all seem to have complete lists of dealers that have pledged not to add dealer markups. And it does appear to be a very comprehensive list. In my neck of the woods, for instance, the vast majority of Ford dealers, I think there's only one that's not on the list, have pledged to not add dealer markup to any Mustang Mach-E purchase. So head over to your dealers. You can order one on Ford.com and start the order process there. But the process of buying a Mach-E is not going to be like a Tesla Model Y. Definitely keep that in mind. I love, love, love Tesla. Tesla's purchasing process. I love the fact that you don't have to go into a dealer. There's no enormous contract. There's no finance manager that sits you down. It's very, very drama free. And buying this is going to be much more like buying a traditional car. Bottom lining the Mach-E at the moment is pretty easy. Pricing is certainly in line with the bulk of the competition. This is a little bit more expensive than the new Volkswagen ID4, but we get more power out of the Mustang and a bit more range as well. So I think the price bump is definitely justified over that Volkswagen. Versus the Model Y, remember that the Mach-E is still gonna qualify for its full federal tax credit. And that is something that has expired on the Tesla lineup. So that's gonna effectively drop the price tag of this by about $7,500 versus what you see on the sticker. The EV segment is about to get very, very crowded over the next few years, but Ford has a bit of a jump start on them because they're going to be able to build 60,000 of these in the first year and then production will ramp up from there. So Ford is not just going to be building a few hundred Mustang Mach-E's and calling it good. They're really diving headfirst into the EV space and very aggressively so with the new Mustang Mach-E. There's also going to be the upcoming GT model, which I have not been able to drive yet, but I suspect most folks are going to be interested in the model that we're looking at today. And again, this is the model that I actually have on pre-order will probably be arriving sometime in mid to late December of this year. So be sure and stay tuned for that. If you're shopping for an electric vehicle with room for four and a large cargo area in the rear, you have two excellent options, this and the Tesla Model Y. Absolutely cannot discount the Tesla Model Y. It has a slightly longer range than we find in the Ford Mustang Mach-E. Cargo area is very, very similar. The interior is also very, very similarly sized. It's very obvious that these two vehicles are directly targeted at the same kind of shopper. Some folks may like the technology in here a little bit better than what we see in that Tesla. Some people may like the Tesla's technology a bit better. But if you want to drive hands off the steering wheel, this is going to be one of the only options available in North America coming up next year with the addition of that $600 over the air update package. As long as you get the prep package that all of this trim are going to have standard. Which one is right for you? Let me know down there in the comment section below. I think at the moment it really is a two horse race. This and the Tesla Model Y. The Jaguar I-Pace is similarly themed, but it's more expensive and it has a different mission in mind. It's much more off-road capable than either this or of course the Tesla Model Y. It has that adaptive air suspension that will jack itself up to Jeep Grand Cherokee heights. It is definitely more focused on that rugged off-road mission than this vehicle is. A lot of folks have been questioning why Ford called this a Mustang. Is this truly the electric pony car of the 21st century? I'll let all of you sound off down there in the comment section. Be sure and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you next week.